Vamos a empezar la sesión de la tarde. Este, tengo el honor de presentar a Adolfo Guillot. Este, para que los que no lo conozcan, digo muchos los conocen, pero los que no, Adolfo este, bueno, estudió la licenciatura en matemáticas aquí en la Facultad de Ciencias, luego hizo un doctorado en Lyon. Este, después de doctorado se integró al instituto en la unidad Cuernavaca en 2002 y posteriormente hizo un postdoc en Brasil este, y regresó y está en la unidad Cuernavaca y ahora lo tenemos en la... Eh, felizmente lo tenemos en el Distrito Federal, no es nada personal con la gente de Cuernavaca. Eh, y bueno, este, en términos de investigación... O sea, este, Adolfo se ha dedicado a estudiar las ecuaciones diferenciales, eh, las acciones de Lee y en general, ¿no? Más o menos es eso. Este, y bueno, hoy nos va a hablar sobre Single Value Solutions of Complex Differential Equations. Pregunta, ¿he de repetirlo en inglés? No. No, ¿verdad? Bueno. <coughs> es que vi el público que ¿Eh? uh, So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am very honored to be uh, talking here. I wish to deeply thank the organizing committee for inviting me. And I would like to tell you some things about differential equations in the complex domain. So I will begin by talking about differential equations. I and I would like to start from the beginning. This is the beginning. Uh, so Newton was investigating lots of things about physics, optics, and then he found something that he thought it was very, very important, and he wrote about it. He was telling us about something, and then he says about his research, the foundations of these operations is evident enough, in fact, but because I cannot proceed with the explanation of it now, I have preferred to conceal it thus. And then he gave us a secret. He gave us instructions, but he concealed these instructions, and then Sometimes later, we found what he wanted to, to say by this. It's an anagram. And here's it. here it is what Newton wanted, us, wanted to say. In English, it means, given an equation involving any number of var variable quantities, fluent quantities, to find the fluxions, the derivatives, and vice versa. He's talking to us about the fundamental theorem of calculus, to, in some sense, to integrate and differentiate functions. So Arnold. Uh, about this quote tells his key, he says that Newton wanted us to tell us, wanted to tell us that solving differential equations is important. And the physics has proved uh, this interpretation right, of course. We have all the 17th, 18th century to, to, to witness. And we were very happy. We had, we had physics and uh, we, we could write differential equations describing this phenomena in physics. Some of them we could integrate directly. Some of them we took more time to integrate. But there were some functions that were deeply related to uh, some differential equations that were re deeply related to some physical problems that we had trouble understanding fully. One of them is the, the equations, o Euler's equation of the spinning top. So you have some solid moving in space. There's no gravity. There's just the masses of the, the inner masses of the body. And when you look at the evolution of the angular momentum, of the body with respect to some uh, particular fixed uh, coordinates linked to the solid body, you find this differential equation. So it's omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 are the components of, the, of this, this angular momentum. We have some uh, uh, constants, i1, i2, i3, that depend on the size, on the shape of the body, and then we have some third quantities to quadratic forms. So the motion of this angular momentum takes place along the intersection of a sphere in dimension three with an ellipsoid. So it's, uh, in general, will give it, be given by some periodic orbit. And these sort of equations, we did not really know how to integrate. Because when you, when you want to understand what happens, say, with the first variable, when you substitute the square of it and you replace all these unknown, and you, you replace by this um, conserved quantities, you find that omega 1 satisfies this sort of differential equation. The, the square of uh, the derivative of omega 1 is a quartic polynomial in the variable. So, we 
these are what are called elliptic integrals, and we can solve them. We cannot really appreciate them in the real setting. We have to go to the complex one. So let me explain you how this is done. This is classical and historical. So you have some quantity, dy over dt, is some square root of some polynomial in y. So you can write it, uh, uh, say, dt. You can separate the variables. So this is dy over the square root of this polynomial, p of y. And uh, so you need to integrate, in some sense, to obtain y of t, you need to integrate this. And this, the true nature of this integral is, is, is only evident when you look into the complex numbers. So let me tell you briefly how you integrate this equation. So you have four in the complex numbers. So let me picture here. This is the Riemann sphere. This is extended complex numbers. And you have four roots of that polynomial where your differential equation with the right-hand side is zero. So in the other places, you have two determinations for the derivative of omega-1. Uh, so, and this determination changes when you go around one of these four points where the right-hand side vanishes. So if you take here, you change. But if you go, so here, you change as well. But if you encompass also the other singularity here, you will not change. So what you can do is, you can draw some, you can cut along these two lines and find one determination of the right-hand side for the equation. And then you can also take another copy where you will cut also along the same two lines. And then this integral really will take place in This integral will take place in a, in, a, in a surface, in a real surface, that you construct by, you know, when you go around this point, you should exit from this one. And then you go, when you go, when you exit in that way, you should enter here. So what you should do is you should go, you should put some, lose some cylinders here to identify. So what you get is the surface of a torus. And when, once you do that, you see that the, the singularities that appear here actually disappear. So what you have is on the right-hand side, so you find after gluing that actually your differential equation doesn't really take place in a surface. It's in, in a Riemann surface. That's a torus. And here the differential equation is just, well, take the complex plane. How you parameterize so it will be time. And how do you parameterize your torus? Well, you just, uh, you can see what the vector field, you can see what the motion is here by just identifying points differing by some linearly, two linearly independent translations. So once you quotient by this, you get the torus, and here the movement in complex time takes place. So actually you should, this drawing, when you see this curve, you should see it in complex three-dimensional space. And then this curve will become a torus minus some points, and motion takes place there. So some features of real functions, of real differential equations, are evident when you look at them in the complex setting. So in the complex setting, also, there are functions that are not really functions. There are functions that are not set theoretic set theoretic functions, but that we, we, we still like to call functions, like the square root or the logarithm. But strangely enough, strange, the, these sort of functions that we find in physics, they are not like that. We find functions that are true set theoretic functions, probably not defined in the whole plane, probably with poles or with essential singularities, but we find Many, many, um, we find this, we find in these equations, the solutions are given by true functions. And then people started investigating what happened with these, uh, with these, with these functions. And then a quest began to understand all the differential equations that have only single-valued solutions. So let me. 
share with you this article by uh, Brio and Bouquet. And then they, they write some of, some of the equations that look like, so it's probably too small here to, to, to be seen. So they want to see some, they try to understand the equations, not of the kind we just saw, but we, probably with higher degree roots appearing in the right-hand side. And then they want to classify the differential equations that have only single-valued solutions. They call them monodrome solutions by saying that when you continue one solution, you still have a solution. So they, they give a classification, but they do not really say this is the classification. They say here's the list of the equations we were not aware of. So we don't know what were the equations that were, they were really aware of, but uh, they have some 12 equations. Uh, and there's some exponents here. I don't, probably you see them, probably you don't. So let me briefly explain the geometry behind these equations of uh, Brion and Bouquet. So let me, before that, so when we study this uh, equation appearing in, the Euler, in Euler's top, we find a sphere and we find a double cover that's a torus. Okay? So for the, others, for the other equations that will appear, let me draw this lattice in C. So we have, so there's a lattice there. And if I take an hexagon and I identify the opposite sides by translations, you know, there's some black ones, there's some white ones, I get also a torus. This torus has an order three automorphism given by rotation around one of the vertices. So this induces an order three uh, rotation of your torus and in the quotient, and this order three rotation would have three fixed points. So, and the quotient will be again uh, a sphere this time we will have three points over which we ramify, three ramification points above three, three leaves, that three branches that ramify above these three points. And that will give us, here's a cubic root, and here's some squares here. So these, and these three points correspond exactly to, to, this, to this drawing I'm showing here. So, This equation will also represent one of the a torus that will cover, and when we lift the differential equation to the torus, will be just standard, the standard, the only differential equation in the torus, which comes from identifying torus with the quotient of the lattice. So we have other, uh, for the other equation, we have the other lattices. So here you find a torus by identifying the opposite sides of the square by translations. You have an order four. Uh, rotation and so on and we have yet another one here we have essentially the same torus as before but here we are considering an order six automorphism and this, this gives a complete if you see this sort of continued with this sort of uh, geometry reasoning you will find the list presented by Brio and, uh, and Bouquet and the thing is well we really need to have So what we have is we have the sphere, and we have some points, and then we take a ramified cover, and then we find some surface where we have a vector field, we find torus in general, or we might find some spheres as well, but we do not find higher genus surfaces. And the reason that why we do not find higher genus surfaces is because vector fields, holomorphic vector fields on these surfaces necessarily have poles. And when you have poles, you have multi-valuation. Say, if you take the square root of t, the derivative is essentially 1 over square root of t. So this square root has two determinations, is multi-valued, and solves the differential equation f prime equals 1 over f. Okay? So if you want to consider if you want to understand differential equations that do not have multivaluedness, then 
in one dimension, you should not have poles. So this, this, is, this happened around 1850, and then came uh, Paul Paul Panlevé, and uh, he gave us a task. So he said, integrate all differential equations. And he said, well, no, not all differential equations. He said, consider all algebraic differential equations. And then he said, understand those that do not have multivaluedness. And he writes that explicitly. Integrate all differential equations. However, he gives us a, a hint on how to proceed. He, say, he says, start from those of, of smaller order. And um, he did start. He did accomplish part of his goal. And he showed us some special functions, some second order functions that have a clue, have, a, have the key to understanding multivaluedness in differential equations. And these are the, the functions that we call the Panlevé transcendence. So these are functions that cannot really be solved, cannot be solved by, in general, by elementary functions. You will not find trigonometric or, or other sorts of, of or even elliptic functions that will will solve these equations. And, uh, and they are related, they, they, are, they may present some multivaluedness, but they are related to this problem of absence of multivaluedness. And what Panlevé did was uh, the method, one of the methods, one of the techniques of Panlevé was the alpha method. So he says, this property, so, so he was studying this property called the that we now call the, the Panlevé property, which he, we call the absence of movable critical points. And so he says this property is stable under, is, it's a closed, in some sense, it's a closed property. It's a property that is closed in the space of differential equations. So if one equation degenerates into another, and the limit one has this property, well, let's say, and if the limit one does not have this property, then it's because the original one didn't have this property either. So let me illustrate this method in, in one setting. So you see all of the all of Panlevé's equations are second order equations. And on the right hand side, we have the derivative of y up to uh, with some it's a quadratic polynomial in the differential of y, just like the first equation. And if you introduce a parameter, so here, you do not really change anything. I just made a scaling in time. But if I make the equation degenerate by making alpha go to zero, I find this differential equation, which is much simpler. Assuming that t is not a pole, assuming that t is just one of the special cases. So we find uh, another equation, which is homogeneous, because of course, if I make now this other, the substitution, I will not change the equation, which is simpler and which, before knowing how to integrate the more complicated equation, I should know how to, how to integrate this simpler equation. So if you look at this equation, and if you see, uh, if you take a look at the equations of studied by Gros and Bouquet, we had this sort of equation. And you, have, you will see that, in fact, when you derivate this equation, we'll find some constant u squared. So actually, it is not difficult to see that this L should have poles. So this equation, the simplified equation, actually belongs to the list given by Brio and Bouquet. So this is the general strategy for, uh, this is one part of the general strategy for Panlevé. Can you please stop the, 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 the cell phones and the Okay, so this is Panlevé doing his work on um, second-order equations. And of course, second-order equations is the beginning of the tower. Well, first-order equations were understood. And then there was an effort to understand third-order equations. This was made by Chassis. He was an astronomer, and he also had this, had this, this studies in differential equations. And... Uh, Chassis sought to understand the equations of the third order that did not have this multivaluedness. 
And he knew that we should start with homogeneous equations, so you get a third order equation that's very general, so you should use this alpha method of Panleve to make it degenerate into some sort of homogeneous equation, and then you start establishing which one of the homogeneous equations you should uh, understand. You should understand these homogeneous equations, and then the idea is to proceed. But in fact, he did not quite finish this. He found this equation. This is a very it's a third order equation. It's a very naive looking equation. You can write it as a vector field. So you have some sort of vector field in C3. And it's, and Chassis uh, proved that we have a different, uh, first integral. So he says, we have some variety in C3 given by a degree 10 polynomial. In fact, this equation is quasi homogeneous. If you give x, y, and z the weights 1, 2, and 3, then you see that this vector field is homogeneous and that this first integral is also homogeneous as well. And for this equation, Panleve, uh, Chassis did not know how to solve it. And he says, well, I think you might be able to solve it by elliptic functions. If you see your, this equation, if you make the substitution a phi a t, you will get again a solution of this equation. This is, it is homogeneous in that sense. And this is around 1911. And in fact, she sees work uh, sort of stopped there. Uh, a lot of work around Panleve equations took work in, in, uh, in Russia, in Japan. Uh, but Chassis's work was sort of overlooked, and uh, we, had to wear, work, we, had, we had to wait around 90 years to get the solution of this equation. So let me tell you what the solution of this equation looks like. So we had a first integral, so we can restrict our vector field to, a, say, a generic level set of this first integral. So, so we have something very explicit. We have an affine variety in C3. We have a polynomial vector field in it. And the question is, well, can we integrate it? Can we say something about it? So let me tell you uh, Cosgrove's answer, Christopher Cosgrove's answer to that question around the year 2000. So the idea is the following. Start considering C2, a lattice, generated by these five, these four vectors. So we're in C2. And we have a lattice, so I know how to draw a lattice in C2. So this lattice has an order 5 symmetry. You can act linearly in C2, and you will find by this order 5 matrix, so zeta is a, a fifth unity, and uh, you will preserve this lattice. So you will get a complex two-dimensional torus, that has some order five automorphism. And so if you want to think in terms of Jacobian, we saw Jacobians this morning. It is the Jacobian of this curve of genus five, which has an order five automorphism given by just multiplying x by some, by this fifth root of unity. And, uh, this action in C2 is linear, so it preserves so both coordinate vector vectors are invariant under multiplication by this matrix. They are eigenvectors. So you may consider the vector fields that they generate. And then you can find one special, there are two special vector fields. Let me take label Z, the one that is associated to the to z square. And then what the solution of Cosgrove is for the chassis 9 equation, it says, well, this is the chassis equation in, restricted, in restriction to one level surface. And what he says is you can take this fine variety with its vector field, and you can embed it into this complex two-dimensional torus. And that's the solution of the equation. So. So he did this, he did much more, he, he, he achieved Chassis' program for 
uh, three-dimensional third order for third order equations. And uh, so let me go, go back to Chassis's question. So Chassis, well, he had a hint. So in general, we can ask. So we have a we have an affine variety. We have a vector field. And if you suppose that the vector field has no multivalued solutions, you suppose this, then what can we say a priori about it? So of course it might be solved by elliptic functions. It might be solved by hyperelliptic functions. But can we say something more? Can we say, can we give some is there enough information to give, to give some, uh, can we say something more about it? Can we solve, can we at least partially solve, uh, in general, this question by Shazi? So, in order to do so, so we have this problem in general, how to, given a polynomial vector field in an affine variety, so what can we say about, how, how, how can we understand this? multivalueness of solutions. So one, uh, one idea is to compactify the affine variety into some projective variety that's now become compact. And when we compactify, our, our vector field, which was polynomial, will become some rational vector field, some meromorphic vector field. So this is a good setting to, to, to work. Actually, we, we can work in a more general setting. Probably we can work in the setting of neuromorphic vector fields on compact complex surfaces. And that's where this, uh, that's where this theorem takes place. It's a theorem in collaboration with uh, Julio Rebello from Toulouse. And it says the following. Suppose you have some meromorphic vector field on a compact complex surface, like the surface you obtain when you compactify an affine variety with a polynomial vector field, and then desingularize it. And then what we do is give, we give some birational theorem, uh, with some, some result that will not tell you what your manifold is, but what your manifold is up to some blowing up and blowing down of some points, as we heard yesterday from Professor Morris. Talk. So, up to blowing up or down some points, you have the following. So either your vector field is holomorphic. This is the situation here. So we added some things to infinity, and then uh, we found some variety where my vector field was holomorphic. The other possibility is the vector field to have a first integral. This is there's the orbits are not really moving all around your surface, but are constrained to live within algebraic curves. So this is uh, setting, uh, another possibility. And the third possibility is that uh, your vector field preserves a vibration. This is, we have some, we have a family of curves in our surface. And then what our vector field does, it, it moves one, one of these curves into the other. And it acts not really, it acts on this um, surface, but it, in fact, it actually acts on the curve given when each curve here is identified to a point. So this is, so you can think of this as a separation of variables. And the way to prove this theorem is to prove, to understand first what, what the problem here is we have a polynomial vector field, and we, when we compactify, we have something that's given by poles. We add the vector field, which was polynomial, gains some poles at infinity. We said that we didn't want poles, but in fact, we don't want poles along the solutions. But we are okay if poles arrive in a way which solutions cannot see at all. So if the solutions and the poles look like this, there's in, princi there's in principle no 
this phenomenon does not happen if the pole, if the solutions went across the curve of poles, we would have some problem. But here, it is not evident what the problem is. Okay, so, so we started trying to understand what, how to simplify or how to modify this locus of poles, because if you modify the locus of poles and you make it disappear, you end with a vector field that has no poles, that is holomorphic, you're done. So there should be some structure. So if you cannot get rid of the curve of poles, well, can you at least give a simple description of it? So what we did is, first, we established that we gave, in some sense, a normal form, a description to which you can take any curve of poles of the vector field. So the curve of poles after these blow-ups or blow-downs might be a rational curve, a sphere. It might be also an elliptic curve, a torus. Or it might have a lot of rational components, a lot of two-dimensional spheres, arranged. Uh, so I'm given here, so it will be an arrangement of, this sphere, of, of these rational curves in the surface. These are what, what are called, at least that part, are what is, what is called the extended thinking diagrams. We saw some thinking diagrams in the, in the Christoph stock. So the, those were the classic thinking diagrams. These are the extended ones. This, uh, so we, have, we are in a surface, in a complex surface. This is a four-dimensional real manifold. And we have spheres. We have many of them. And we can construct a graph in the following way. So give me a vertex for each one of these spheres and put an edge between two of them if they intersect. So there's more information to this, to this diagram I'm, I am not showing. But we, are, we, we can prove that these are, in some sense, the limit uh, configurations of curves. These are the curve of poles up to some blowing ups and blowing downs. And if you're acquainted with the geometry of, uh, of surfaces of, or the classification of surfaces that uh, Professor Mori was talking about yesterday, you have probably seen some related diagram uh, in Kodaira's uh, description of uh, elliptic vibrations. So I will not say a lot about it. Let me just say that. Well, I will say something about it. So, so, so suppose you have elliptic curves, and you have a lot of them. You have a, a, cur a complex curve of elliptic curves. We saw that there are some elliptic curves that have automorphisms. I have, for example, order three automorphisms. So you might construct some automorphisms of this uh, situation by doing the following. So here I have a, a disk. It's a one-dimensional complex curve. And I may construct a global, in some situations, a global order three automorphisms, say, by rotating here by some order three transformation and then applying my order three transformation to all, the, to all the elliptic curves here. So I will act in general nicely uh, 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 away from this elliptic curve. But here, in my, I will find, well, I will find in my, uh, for the quotient of this elliptic curve with its three fixed points, I will find, as we saw, one sphere. But then at these three points, I will find some singularities, some mild singularities, but singularities as well, that we can solve. And once we solve these singularities, we find, for example, this configuration. So when you see a disconfiguration of curves, of rational curves in the surface, you should think that it comes from one of these situations. I have a vibration, what is called a vibration of elliptic curves, and that I had a quotient by some finite order here. Okay, so you should think of them as elliptic curves, as degenerate elliptic curves. And I'm saying that this is, uh, 
Did you see this is much like the situation of uh, Van Levy and uh, Brian Bouquet. So they said, when these equations degenerate, at the end I see something that's, whose description is related to these elliptic curves with symmetries. So here as well, I, have, I, I do not really have this degeneration. I have an ambient two-dimensional uh, complex manifold. And then I, I have that, in some sense, uh, if you think of this curve of poles as something that happens at infinity, then when I approach infinity, I find one of these symmetric elliptic curves giving the description uh, of what happens at infinity. And in fact, if you're in a... So this is just combinatorial, but uh, we do not know exactly what the situation is like when you, we look at this configuration of curves in general, but if we were in a compact manifold, then we know that there's a vibration that comes with this drawing. So from all of these curves, which are in some sense hints of vibration, we get this vibration, and either your vector field will be tangent to these fibers, then we have a first integral, or transverse, and then we will preserve this vibration, or if we are able to make this uh, poles, this curve of poles disappear, uh, we find a holomorphic vector field. Okay, so, so this is one possibility that we, might, we may give more detail to it, so if you have, a, if you're like in the setting that we started with of a, an algebraic and affine surface with a algebraic surface with a polynomial vector field, you will find some variety which is algebraic, then Keller. And in fact, we understand very well, it's, I don't know, probably Kodaira, probably earlier, we understand very well what uh, polymorphic vector fields are on algebraic Keller surfaces. So most of them, uh, so all of them either preserve a vibration or they are related to complex tori. Okay, so you can, if you do not consider in gen general compact complex surfaces, but say algebraic ones, you may replace this x is holomorphic by you have a complex torus and you have a um, holomorphic map a holomorphic vector field in this complex torus. So the situation is different for, for the non-Keller setting. So the, it was just, uh, the, the, the full classification was only obtained 15 years ago by uh, Bluski, Olger Klaus, and Thoma, uh, which finished the, who finished the classification of uh, vector fields, holomorphic vector fields and surfaces. And the difficulty is uh, that we know very little about non-Keller, we know a lot, but not, not enough about non-Keller surfaces. That they do not fit nicely into the Enriquez Kodaira. They do fit, but we do not have a big classification uh, in the non-Keller setting, contrary to the algebraic setting. I will come back to this classification later. Okay, so. Uh, So this, is, this relates a lot to, so there's a lot of people who, who have been interested in uh, understanding uh, polynomial vector fields in affine varieties. We have this extra property that not only they, ha they are uh, single-valued, so they have single-valued solutions, but they are, actually have solutions defined for all time, so that they induce some biholomorphic mappings of this underlying algebraic varieties, not necessarily algebraic mappings, just by holomorphic. So let me just give two statements. There's one by Marco Brunella in 2002. Uh, uh, we can consider complete polynomial vector fields and affine surfaces, and Brunella gave a classification that has uh, common elements with the theorem I just stated. He proved that, uh, building on work by McQuillan and uh, Suzuki, he proved that uh, they preserve rational vibration and then classify, the, classify them up to polynomial automorphism. And more recently, uh, Kalimann 
gut sind, gut schön Bauch und Löwen, danke. Dave for general uh, algebraic surfaces, surfaces, surfaces. Uh, a complete description of how curves are uh, arranged at infinity using this vibration, uh, existence of this vibration. Okay, so. So the, the tools that I just described that I'm not really saying how, how do we prove this theorem, how do we conclude that this, uh, the structure or the configuration of curves is this one. Let me tell you other things that we can deduce by the same tools. I, I know we are, I, am, uh, I am skipping some parts here. Uh, so in general, what we have is some uh, way to understand combinatorially curves, invariant algebraic curves, or invariant curves uh, in surfaces. So another situation is the situation, uh, uh, so I, I will change a bit of, uh, of setting. It's the same as it's vector fields and surfaces. So let me change a bit. So suppose you have a complete vector field. So you have a complete vector field, X. So you have an action, holomorphic action, of the group of complex numbers on a space. And suppose that you have one singular point of your space. So you may ask, well, how compatible are these two hypotheses? How how, how singular can a singular point be in the presence of a complete vector field? So this, this result gives, a, gives an answer. In the case, my space is what is called a Stein space. So Stein spaces include affine varieties, or the analytic version of uh, affine varieties. And so if you have a Stein surface, two-dimensional, and you have some singular point, and you suppose that the zeros of x do not accumulate to your singular point, then you can be very explicit on what your singular point is, and, and in some situations, much more. And this is the content of this result. So you have, you have just this um, Stein space, and then what the result says is that you only have two possibilities. So the first one is what is called a quasi-homogeneous singularity. So you have some, for example, a homogeneous singularity is quasi-homogeneous. So you have one homogeneous polynomial, and then you just act by uh, multiplying by some non-zero complex number. And you can do so in, first of all, the quasi-homogeneous setting, when you give different weights to different variables, you will need to weight your alpha as well. So this is the first possibility. And in fact, when you're in this first possibility, you actually know there's a, a result by uh, Camacho, Mogasati, and Descartes that says that if you're in this time space and you have an action of the multiplicative group of complex numbers minus zero, actually your time space is an affine variety and your action is algebraic. You're just looking at it in the wrong coordinates. So in the first situation, you get just by supposing that you have one singularity, in some sense, it's, it's these two hypotheses imply too much. No, it's, it's uh, too much to ask. So you have the situation. And the second situation is that you have a cyclic quotient singularity. You're, if you're in C2 and you have some nth root of unity and you act linearly, on C2, then the quotient 
under the action of the group generated by this map. has some singularity that's called a cyclic quotient singularity. And that's the only other option you may have uh, for the, what the singular point uh, of the vector field and of the whole space may be. So, and this is uh, essentially with the same tools as uh, the previous theorem with, uh, with Giulio Rebello. When you have one singularity, you can desingularize it. So you replace, in fact, this, this point by some curves in such a way that when you considering that singular point is the same thing as collapsing all this set of curves into a point. And here is essentially the same setting. We have an analog setting of the one we had before. So we have a vector field, and we have a curve which is invariant under the vector field. So you can do an analog. Uh, you, can, you can try to make the combinatorics again, and in this uh, Stein setting, it works very well. So this is another uh, result, and let me just... Uh, I told you before that this, uh, there is this theorem by Glusky, Roger Klaus, and Thoma, where they classified holomorphic vector fields on uh, compact. They finished this classification. This classification has been going on for a long time. So there's some things that uh, we know from a very long time. But there's this uh, dark side of uh, compact complex surfaces called the 7-0 class. And they finished this classification by classifying the surfaces in this, uh, in this class, this class includes uh, hop surfaces, Cato surfaces, uh, uh, and they, they finish the classification of vector fields in this class. And it's an interesting because we do not have a classification for this class. We do not know what, we do not know if every, the conjecture is that every surface we know in this class is one of the ones we know of. But it's just a conjecture. Uh, the conjecture is that all the missing equations are, all the missing surfaces are what are called cathode surfaces. So they did this, uh, so Lusky, Roger, Klaus, and Thoma did this classification uh, for the 7 0 class. And in fact, using essentially the same tools as I have described, we can give a simple proof of the results. I will give a statement, but the idea is the same. If you have a compact complex surface and you have a holomorphic vector field, you will find some invariant algebraic curves. These invariant algebraic curves, if there's a lot of them, you know, uh, this, this things, the, 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 all the things we know of, uh, of surfaces tell us that there cannot be many, uh, many invariant curves unless we have a vibration. And if you work, uh, we, have the same, we have the same setting. We have a complex surfaces. We have a holomorphic vector field, which is in particular complete. So its solutions are always single valued. So we can use the same set, the same uh, sort of combinatorics. And we have this, uh, we can give this statement in, in a very, not expensive way, let me say it like that. So with the same combinatorics. So this, this fits into the classification of uh, holomorphic vector fields and surfaces. I'm not giving you the complete statement. Just let me give you this statement that can be really easily obtained by, this sort of, by this, the same sort of argument. So you have a holomorphic vector field, which is not identically zero, on a complex surface. And you assume that it has some zeros. If, uh, if it doesn't. Like in this case, then you leave it out. And you suppose as well that uh, it does not induce an action of C star. It does not, not every, not all the solutions are periodic with the same period. So under this hypothesis, you can conclude that either your surface is rational or ruled. In this case, you understand the surface. It's a very, you understand the surface. On the second, your vector field has a first integral, so you can 
see your surface as a disjoint union of curves, and your vector field will be tangent to them, as algebraic curves, and your vector field will be tangent to them. The fourth possibility is that S is one of these uh, surfaces that fall in, within the 7 0 class, a Kato surface. And uh, this is very strange because they really fit in a very interesting way in this classification, Kato surfaces. And the fourth possibility is that your curve, your algebraic invariant curves, is actually one of the curves uh, that we saw in this extended thinking diagrams. So in particular, you will have some uh, divisor in your surface of self-intersection zero, and then you can continue uh, with the classification from this data. For example, here you will, have, you will find these uh, Hopf, Enoki, um, surface there's elliptic vibrations coming from this third item of the classification. So I will stop here. I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yes. So in, gen in general, when I have in a complex surface, when I have in a compact surface, say, when I have compact curves, I can draw this diagram. So I, with one point for each curve, uh, uh, you can actually get weights. So I can count the intersection multiplicity and draw as many edges or as, as the multiplicity. And I can put it also into this. Uh, diagram the self-intersection of a curve with itself, so I can, there's more to it than just the graph, and that I can build always. So what I'm saying is that, uh, so in general, for this problem of deciding whether the solutions of your differential equations are multivalued or not, you really don't, don't mind if you blow up or down some points. So this, is, this property will be, will be uh, invariant under blow-ups and blow-downs. So under birational transformation, bimeromorphic transformations. So what I'm saying is, I, uh, in some sense, it's a, it's a baby uh, minimal setting. So you, you, you can, so I, I don't know, it might be very complicated because if I, have, if I have some curve of poles, I may blow up a lot of points and give some very complicated diagram, but it is unnecessarily complicated. So I may start blowing down some points and, and, and rearranging the combinatorics. And I said, I can always guarantee you that if, the solu the, you have no multivalued solutions for your vector field, at the end you find one of those uh, combina the combinatorics is one of those described by the extended thinking diagrams, which, peer, which are also called the um, Kodaira's list of, uh, of uh, singular elliptic fibers. Yes, you do, as yesterday in, in Professor Morris' talk, if you find a minus one curve, you blow it down. So you have a curve with, rational curve with self intersection, minus one, you blow it down, and then that's the... So probably you have to blow up a bit at the beginning, but after a certain time, you just start blowing down all minus one curves. Alberto, With two, two, yeah. I, I think there are some. But I think, so I, I, uh, I heard from uh, Marco Brunella the following question. Do we have, is there a complete holomorphic, not, not more polynomial, but holomorphic vector field on C2 with an infinite number of singular points? Of equilibrium points. I don't know. Probably all, all of them. Okay, so I don't know. So this is. Uh,
combinatorics is because you have multivalidness somewhere. So you can actually use this combinatorics to, to exhibit uh, multivalidness. Well, the first obstruction will be, so if you have one trajectory that goes across the curve of poles, then certainly you will have multivalidness along the solution, and in, uh, in fact, along many solutions, neighboring this one. But you can use this as a, some sort of, um, you can try, you can, if, you're not, if, you're not, if you do not have this sort of things, you can use this as an algorithm. We have listed a lot of obstructions and then seeing that these obstructions lead to this combinatorial. 